These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Whether Joshua did or did not conquer Canaan, and wherever he and his people originated from, at some point there was a certain people who formed a kingdom of Israel and a kingdom of Judah, and for some reason the educated classes in Judah believed both of these kingdoms, despite their generations of warfare, shared a common origin through a united monarchy which in turn had its origin in a peculiar religiously based tribal confederation. This odd and poorly understood period of time is, in biblical terms, the Age of the Judges, described in the Book of Judges, in Ruth, and really in the latter half of Joshua, though the full judge's government doesn't seem to arise until Joshua dies. Historically speaking, if the United Monarchy is thought to have maybe formed sometime around 1000 BCE, which fits in pretty well with most dating schemes, then we're talking about the period from 1200 to 1000 BCE, often called, archaeologically, Iron Age I. Much like our previous discussions, there is a lot of that history just can't say about this period. It's yet another of many, many Dark Ages. How the biblical authors could manage to write their histories with so consistent an eye to what would be obscure thousands of years later is truly remarkable. And yet we're now on a general upslope of information. The people of Israel are, in the judge's narrative, more or less settled and operating in a wider political context. And because of that, we can finally talk about archaeological evidence. And in coming centuries, we'll finally be able to talk about actual written sources, more than just a random word here, to, or here and there. But first, last time we talked about a population of Israelites who were just beginning to settle in the Jordan River Valley. If this is the case, we should expect to see traces of towns settled by Israelite people in the archaeological record. And indeed we do. Or at least, some people think that we do. There are definitely settlements arising in this particular region, in this particular time period, and culturally, they're generally consistent with Western Semitic cultural practices and material economy. In fact, they are in many ways so consistent with other Western Semitic cultural sites in the Levant that there is a body of scholars who does not believe that there was any distinctive Israelite people separate from the wider body of Canaanites. And yet a wide similarity between the Israelites and their neighbors is really something that we should expect going into an archaeological investigation. The people of Israel, by every account, either biblically or extra-biblically, are in fact a Western Semitic people. They speak a Western Semitic language, live in a Western Semitic area, claim to originate from that same Western Semitic area, and throughout both the Bible and historical investigations, people have always made much of how similar they are to the surrounding cultures, at least in ancient times. Compare that to the Philistines, a people who we should perhaps now introduce. The Philistines first show up in the historical record as the Peleset when they encounter the Egyptian army on their journey from somewhere in the general area of Greece and the islands over to the area which will later be called Palestine. In many ways, there are echoes of the Israelite story in the Philistines, though one that's much harder to untangle because they left so little written record. And of course, we don't have a centuries later Bible of the Philistines to work off of either. It isn't known why they left Greece precisely, but it had to do probably with the collapse of the Mycenaean period of Greek history. Maybe climate left the land too poor to keep farming. Maybe invaders from the north pushed these people out of their ancient lands. Whatever the case, they got on their boat and decided that anywhere was better than the place they had been, and they became one of many sea peoples. 
Now, their big day in the sun was the Battle of the Delta around the year 1175 BCE, where Pharaoh Ramesses III, not the second of the Exodus, fought a collection of sea peoples in a big battle. Now, was this one battle? A bunch of desperate people banding together, hoping to break into the fertile Nile Delta? Was this a series of campaigns against smaller communities which had landed in the marginal areas of the Delta and maybe begun squatting with no better place to be? The details aren't super clear, but the Pharaoh wins the battle overall. Then he claims to deport the Peleset to southern Canaan. And a little digression here, a little note on sources. I use Wikipedia. It's a fantastic starting point for my research. I read most of the stuff in the reference sections on there, or at least I look through it when I can get my hands on it to see how relevant that stuff is. Now, it's not the end of my research, not by a long shot, but I really value most of the ancient history articles that have been put together on Wikipedia. That said, the entire website especially around any subjects that even tangentially touch biblical topics, is absurdly hyper-skeptical. As I write this, and of course it may always change, Wikipedia being what it is, Wikipedia mentions that archaeology has not been able to corroborate this apparent mass relocation of the Peleset. Now, for sure, Israel Finkelstein, perhaps the biggest name in biblical archaeology these days, does not think that this deportation occurred. But just like pretty much everything Finkelstein says, this is hotly debated. And I, I do swear, if Finkelstein wrote a book about how delicious his pancakes were one morning, there would be a whole crop of archaeologists coming out and insisting that those pancakes were cold and dry. But anyway, the crux of the argument is that the Peleset, who pretty much everyone agrees is the Egyptian name for the Philistines, were supposedly deported to southern Canaan in 1175. But then we don't see evidence of them dominating the region until the 1130s. We have no idea where they could have gone during that period. No evidence for them, hardly at all, as a distinct people with a characteristic territory. But of course, this is the Bronze Age collapse, one of the darkest periods in all of history. Finkelstein is good to read, but not if he's your only source on things. He often has very strong interpretations. But we don't strongly doubt pretty much anyone else's claims to have deported prisoners to some other part of the nation. In fact, we generally assume that when the Babylonians or the Assyrians claim to have deported someone, that well, it probably happened, and that if there's a lack of evidence that the culture in, is in the target spot, then it's proof that the deportation policy was effective, and it causes the prisoners to integrate into their wider culture. I'm fine with people challenging and testing biblical claims. I'm fine with finding biblical history to even be mistaken. But I really get frustrated by the number of people who apply a different level of historical evidence to Bible-related things, pushing this insane hyper-skepticism at all levels when a similar investigation over in Mesopotamia would be far more even-handed and epistemically cautious or even accepting of textual sources. Anyway, going past the ranting, the Philistines arrive in southern Canaan either as part of a deportation in 1175 or because they see on Iron Age Twitter that the Egyptians have pulled out of Canaan around 1130 and decide that, oh, now is the time to finally get out of their boats after being expelled from their homeland some 70 or 100 years earlier. Also possible, though rarely discussed for lack of evidence, is maybe there were multiple waves of entry. 
Anyway, once the Egyptians finally lose control of the last bits of Canaan around 1130 BCE, the Philistines come to dominate a set of five cities in southern Canaan, often called the Philistine Pentapolis, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. Interestingly, these appear to be the only sea peoples who really succeeded in their new land. The rest mostly seem to vanish, either completely or dwindling rapidly into obscurity. Slaughtered or integrated the whole lot of them. Like other minor powers, the individual cities rose and fell in prominence over the centuries of the Iron Age, and Philistine power as a whole waxed and waned at various points. The details are hard to get at because these people would be super obscure if they hadn't appeared in the Bible, but archaeologically they are at least distinct in certain ways. Having come over from the general area of Greece, they have a language related to the Greeks. They have numerous material culture similarities to Mycenaean material culture, that is to say the shape of their pottery and tools and so forth, and most interestingly, pretty recently they've been able to do DNA analysis of bodies in Philistine graveyards and determine that the corpses do in fact have genetic ties to Greece. Now, because of these distinctive archaeological elements, we can trace their rise and confirm that the Pentapolis do seem to have been rather prosperous from about 1100 to 1000 BCE, precisely the time when the biblical book of Judges is complaining about their dominance. But before looking at their interactions with the Jews, a quick sketch of their history. After about 1000 BCE, many of the things that makes them archaeologically distinctive start to fade away. The power of these cities doesn't diminish, but they adopt the Canaanite alphabet. They abandon their Greek-influenced pottery and tools, and most interestingly, they might adopt the popular Levantine practice of circumcision. Note that after about the time of King David, the Bible does remain hostile to the Philistines, but never again uses the pejorative epithet uncircumcised to describe them, which fits the general picture of the Philistines as integrating into wider Canaanite culture. Anyway, though they adopt local ways, they don't vanish as a people, and they remain a powerful set of cities all throughout the period of the Israelite monarchy, until they're finally destroyed by the Assyrians. Now, this is interesting all on its own. These are, after all, the people who give the region of Palestine its name, but it's also interesting as a contrasting test case. As a people who enter into Canaan at about the same time as Israel emerges, though from the opposite side, and then gradually assimilate into local customs, they are most visible at the point of their greatest divergence, when they preserve the greatest amount of their Mycenaean customs and material culture. Still, though, even with biblical supporting evidence, there is so little we can say about the Pentapolis precisely just because they happened to rise to power in a super obscure time and place. Contrast that then with the case of Israel. Here, too, there's very little that we can see because of the obscurity of the era. Then add to it that these people should be expected to be broadly similar in character and ethnicity to their Canaanite cousins. Indeed, their religious mythos makes a big deal about how Israel and all its neighbors share close family relationships back in the forgotten mists of time. The language which would become Hebrew is at this point barely a dialect of the Canaanite language. What then would we hope to find in such poor archaeological soil to mark off the Israelites specifically? The answer is very little. Four principal archaeological markers in a settlement have been used to denote a place as Israelite or not. Each of these is disputed. Each of these is found in some places but not others, and even if all four are taken together, the sum total doesn't create that much of a different impression compared to neighboring places. 
To start with an example that pretty clearly shows the difficulty of working this all out, one of the main characteristics of an Israelite settlement is what is called the four-room house. Now this is an architectural style, specifically talking about the floor plan. Imagine a house with a front door leading into one large room, or sometimes no door at all, just an opening into a large room, which may or may not have been completely roofed. So it might be a sort of a little garden area, walled area, or it could have been roofed and just a large living room. Then on the back, or perhaps the side wall, there are three smaller rooms along this wall. Now, the larger room may have been for various household industry during the day, all the cooking and textile work that took up the bulk of a woman's life, and at night likely housed a number of animals. The three back rooms may have been bedrooms for the humans, storage for food and goods, and or a bathroom. There is naturally some variation in this floor plan from family to family, but that's the general sense of this four-room house. In contrast to this, the standard Canaanite pattern is called the three-room house. Guess how many rooms that has? Imagine here a room with a front door on one wall and a back door on another wall. This is the first room you walk into. Now that back door, you walk through that, it leads to another room more or less about the same size as the previous room, sometimes a bit smaller, a bit bigger. But that middle room then in turn has a door to a third room. Now I do say door a lot of times. These internal openings would have just been empty doorways or cloth curtains, but you get what I mean. Three rooms roughly in a row. It immediately creates a dynamic where the first room is the most public. That's the one where you're welcoming guests in, and the third room is the most private. Now, these three rooms, they're not always in a straight line, uh, but they often are, creating a sort of row house effect where a bunch are together. Though, just as often, neighboring three-room houses are smooshed up like in different directions with each other, and you look at it from above and it's kind of like a Tetris kind of thing. There's not r nice broad alleyways with clean, even row houses like we might have in San Francisco or something. It's a bunch of alleyways and doors are just sort of popping out anywhere and everybody's house is oriented in a different direction. Why? That seems to be just how they liked it. Now, what's the value of a three-room house versus a four-room house? Well, I honestly couldn't tell you. It's pretty easy to sort of look at the floor plan and imagine the different house configurations that are possible, especially since I'm in the process of building my own house in the modern day right now, so my mind's gotten a little bit more attuned to floor plans. But there don't generally seem to have been any objective merits of one house type over the other, just a general cultural preference for one over the other. But this preference is not absolute. While it has been claimed that four-room houses are only found in Israelite settlements and three-room only in Canaanite settlements, both have been found in both. And the more careful archaeologists will usually point to a preponderance of one type or another and say something guarded like, a large number of four-room houses has, in similar sites, been classed as a potential marker of Israelite settlement, or something of that sort. Now, the Bible never tells us how many rooms an Israelite house should have, and it just seems to be one of those random cultural preferences that a society picks more or less arbitrarily. Now, another cultural marker quite similar to the four-room house is a certain type of pottery called collared rim or pithoi after the similar Greek style. Now, the Canaanite world in general was, as befits a highly diverse region, something of a riot of different pottery styles in different periods, from ornate juglets that wealthy Canaanites would have to well-crafted red and white slip variants. 
Now, the newly entered Philistines produced a Greek-style bichrome, or two-colored pot, and in all of this, the various cultures traded relatively freely with each other, so it isn't unusual to find foreign styles in a village. Add to this the fact that Israelite settlements didn't develop their distinctive collared rim pottery type right away, copying local Canaanite styles initially, and what you're left with is just a mess. Now, classically, archaeology loves pottery. It's durable in that at least the pottery shards can often survive much longer than pretty much anything else that an ancient civilization produces. And it's often a marker for culture more broadly. In fact, many of the most ancient prehistoric societies are archaeologically identified by little more than their pottery type. A new type of pottery means a new culture is present. No new pottery, no new peoples. And yet recently we're starting to see pushback from within archaeological circles against the power of pottery in ancient analysis. The rallying cry seems to be, pots are not people. And the thrust of the argument is that pottery types don't actually match perfectly with cultural boundaries. In modern ethnography, we sometimes see the same pottery type covering multiple distinct cultures, while other times we see the same culture with multiple pottery types, sometimes even distinctified by region. Looking over time periods, we can see again in modern ethnographies cultural shifts that involve pottery changes and pottery changes which occur absent cultural shifts. And so when it comes to Israelite pottery, you'll see some people claiming that there is no clearly distinct pottery type which we can pin on early Israelite settlements, especially not the early ones. And therefore, there must have been no clearly distinct Israelite people. At the exact same time, you'll see other people claiming that because we definitely have a clear distinct pottery type, that collared rim jar, we must also have necessarily a clearly distinct people group. It really seems that both sides are maybe correct in their analysis of pottery, and whether they are or not, they're both overstretching their conclusions there. The claimed Israelite connected collared rim jar is not a clear cut connection. It emerges late, much later than many of the settlements themselves, and it really does seem like early Israel didn't have a distinctive pottery type. That said, as things get closer to the year 1000, these same settlements, in some cases, do develop a pottery type, but we don't see it in every settlement which we believe to be Israelite. Then we look at the context. Canaan in this period is a highly diverse place. The economic plans run the full range from full nomadism to full urbanism, with everything in between. The geography changes radically, from hard desert to craggy hillsides to river valley to Mediterranean coastline, all within a remarkably short span. The trade situation, while stunted during the Bronze Age collapse, does still exist, especially in a local context, keeping this crossroads of trade connected at least in part to the rest of the known world. And of course, ethnically, we have all kinds of people, not just the Israelites and Philistines, making their entrance into a region that was already pretty diverse to begin with. These conditions are vastly more unsettled than most times and places, and may do a lot to break the hard connection between a people and their pottery. How and when a people assimilates into another culture is something that's fascinated me lately, and while I do anticipate finding a place to go into it more deeply, probably during the Neo-Assyrian period, it's enough for now to note that ancient Canaan had a tendency to homogenize its constituent populations while also drawing from nearby empires. And so from the confused facts about ancient Israelite pottery, we draw an even more confused collection of conclusions, which 
we have now also concluded is probably wrong. Does this mean that we throw out all of the archaeology because some people are questioning this link long considered fundamental between culture and pottery? No, we don't. What can surprise most of all is how little pushback the pots are not people refrain is getting. Because I think at a certain level, most professional archaeologists, they recognize the limitations of their field, even if they sometimes get carried away in practice. And recognizing limits on a form of evidence does not mean that the evidence should be ignored, merely that it should be weighed. And on balance, it's not unreasonable to say that the presence of collared rim jars, like the presence of four-room houses, can suggest, but not prove, that the settlement belongs to Israelite culture. So, if our first two archaeological proofs of Israelite settlement don't actually prove Israelite settlement, and aren't really tied directly to anything in the biblical story, why do we think that these are, in fact, Israelite settlements? Well, some of these things are found when we look up places mentioned in the Bible as Israelite settlements. But in fact, we don't always see these evidences when looking at supposed Israelite settlements listed in the Bible. Still, there is a preponderance of these two archaeological markers when examining sites during periods which the Bible tells us that these sites should be occupied by Israelites, though often these markers don't appear during the earliest periods. That is, they don't appear right at the period around 1200 when Joshua should be out conquering, but much later, closer to the period of the monarchy. But beyond the four-room house and the collared rim jar, there are two more archaeological indicators that are a bit less consistent and a bit more controversial because they're a lot more interesting. In the Old Testament, as we have it today, there are famously 613 so-called laws of Moses as traditionally understood by modern Judaism. Now, it isn't completely clear how many of those existed at the earliest stages, and most of those would leave little remains in any case. But perhaps the most famous of the laws is the prohibition on eating the meat of pigs, what is nowadays developed into the kosher laws. The dietary laws were much broader than pigs alone, but the other rules are archaeologically far more subtle. We would expect if there was a community keeping a religiously based ban on pig eating, that when we investigate the sites of their settlements, we should find the bones of a variety of animals, sheep, goats, cattle, but not pig bones. Interestingly, when we look at communities believed to be Israelite, one of the frequently confirming evidences is a lack of pig bones in the community. Now, this by itself is not an absolute thing. There are some communities believed by some to be Israelite where pig bones are found. Now, some would argue that this is evidence of Canaanites living in the same area or of Israelites falling away from the laws of Moses, something which the Old Testament complains of pretty much constantly, or that the dating is wrong either on the settlement or the pig bones. On the other hand, there are communities in the region which are pretty definitely not Israelite. For example, the Highland Amorite settlements in the north, which also themselves often lack pork. Now, this Amorite lack of pigs is possibly because pigs just don't do well in those areas, which some argue may also apply to certain areas of Israelite settlement. Or it may be because, as we saw back in our Animals episode, many in the Near East had a generally poor opinion of eating pig meat, which may or may not be related to the Mosaic prohibition. Plus, if we can justify the presence of pig bones by saying, oh, the community was apostatizing from the laws of Moses, and we can justify the absence of pig bones by saying that the community was following the law of Moses, we may well be keeping 
to the moral lessons of the Old Testament, but we've also set ourselves up in an unfalsifiable position, muddying the waters beyond all recognition. However, we shouldn't overstate the confusion. Like with the four-room house and the colored rim jar, the lack of pig bones is often a sign of suspected Israelite settlement. But especially as we get into more religiously based potential evidences, the volume of the debate rises sharply without a corresponding increase in the actual data. Now, nothing exemplifies this as much as the fourth indicator of Israelite settlement, a lack of religious idols. The second commandment is pretty fundamental to the religious agenda of Yahweh worship as we understand it from Scripture, and pretty close to unique among the religious traditions of the Near East. In the various polytheist traditions of Egypt, Mesopotamia, Canaan, and their neighbors, Building temples to house a statue of a god was a core part of the religion, and often so was buying or crafting small idols for your own house. In a biblical Jewish household, however, the worship of idols was forbidden, and at least sometimes forbidden on pain of death. If that prohibition was in effect during the 1200s, we should expect those earliest settlements to lack divine images, while their Canaanite neighbors would naturally continue to produce and house such images. And interestingly enough, it's argued that this is exactly what we find. Israelite settlements generally lack religious images. If this is, in fact, a sign of a peculiar religious system in these settlements, then it helps confirm that there was some sort of iconoclastic religious group emerging during the Bronze Age collapse, and considering the earlier mentions in Egyptian records of Yahweh and Israel, it's not hard to convince many people of a pattern emerging which may confirm the core historical facts that Israel arose at this time and had something recognizable as Jewish beliefs. But as with everything, this evidence as well is contested. It is ultimately an argument from silence. We're deciding something definite about a community because of something we don't happen to find in that community. But we know that in archaeology, the vast majority of physical items that were created and interacted with in any given period do not in fact survive to be dug up in modern times. Plenty of small settlements where no one expects religious iconoclasm simply haven't turned up anything recognizable as idols. And these target settlements are uniformly quite small, the largest being estimated at 400 to 600 people. Plus, as I believe I've mentioned, archaeology in the Bronze Age collapse is incredibly difficult, and little has survived from this period just in general. To conclude off this one evidence, really this one lack of evidence, and decide anything at all, is a bit irresponsible. Now, I know I said there were four main evidences, but of those four, there's actually six. And yeah, I was just complaining about the Bible being bad with numbers, but these last two are much more tenuous, but they're interesting enough to be worth mentioning, even if... Uh, they might not always be really worthwhile. Following the line of digging up the ancient Israelite religion, one of the big themes, particularly in the early part of the Old Testament, is male circumcision. The people of God, and by extension, God himself, seem from Scripture to be remarkably excited about clipping their wicks. And so, it's been proposed that where one finds circumcision tools, this may go along with Israelite settlement. This, however, is perhaps the weakest of all the seriously proposed suggestions that I've seen, as circumcision was actually commonly practiced among both many Semitic peoples and at various times in Egypt itself, so a circumcision tool may well come from those neighboring cultures. On the opposite side, 
These tools are very rarely actually discovered. Many Israelite sites have no known circumcision tools in their archaeological inventory, and many of these things that are suggested tools, I mean, they're, they're cutting implements. They're basically small knives, and their actual purpose is very easy to debate. Looking a bit deeper at the evidence more broadly, though, I think it's clear that every single one of these proposed Israelite settlement evidences is contested. In fact, every last thing about ancient Israel, modern Jews, and scripture as a whole appears to be contested by somebody. But with regards to settlement, at least, while any individual element is insufficient to tell us that a settlement is Israelite, multiple evidences together, along with circumstantial things like biblical mentions, really can start to paint a picture. And that picture looks like a bunch of settlements around the Jordan River Valley around the year 1200 and later, belonging to a people who, in at least some ways, appear to conform to our picture of the Israelites in the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Like the individual evidences, that whole picture can be contested. But the question I always ask myself when looking at biblical archaeology specifically is if the people writing these arguments would hold a proposed Kassite settlement on the Tigris River to the same evidentiary standard to which they're holding a proposed Israelite settlement on the Jordan. And looking finally at the sixth of our four evidences, is not any particular thing in an Israelite settlement, but the general sense of the conditions. Now, some have argued that the Israelites coming out of the desert could have had a strong egalitarian sentiment, either based on religious convictions or from carrying over the habits of nomadism into settled life. And sure enough, we do find that pretty much all of the early Israelite settlements are economically non-stratified, relatively speaking. The difference between the poorest houses and the richest houses are relatively small. And this is something that's very common in nomadic tribes, in modern communes, and in very poor settlements. While it is possible that Israelite settlements in the early days were deliberately keeping themselves small and poor in order to be humble before the Lord, it's also argued, I think pretty convincingly, that these settlements may have been small and poor just because they were small and poor. And as soon as the Israelites had the economic conditions to not be small and poor anymore with the beginning of the monarchy, they seem to have stopped being small and poor just about as quick as they could manage. Thus, an egalitarian settlement pattern, often a euphemism for a poor community, may be a sign of religiously motivated humility and equality and fraternity and brotherhood amongst men, or it may just be a sign that these people were poor because they lived in a miserable region of the world with very few resources during a time when trade had largely collapsed and everybody was running around raiding each other and killing each other. Of course, we have reason to think that they may have lived in subjugation to an outside power also, which is rarely a great thing for a town's prosperity. But that's impossible. After all, the land of Israel was promised to the people of God, and we know from the book of Joshua that the invasion experienced an unbroken streak of successes, even conquering cities that they later admitted they never conquered. And here is where I was going to talk about the Israelite military defeats quite possibly by a massive Egyptian army, definitely by the Philistines, probably multiple times, and pretty clearly some other defeats as well by all the various neighbors that they had. This was going to lead into a discussion of the narrative in the Book of Judges and what it may represent historically, though we have little evidence for the specifics outside of settlement patterns, 
but then it seems I got a bit long-winded talking about archaeology, and so join us next time as we stretch what was originally going to be a single episode into now eight episodes just getting us to the Book of Judges. And to think it wasn't that long ago that we crossed the same 120 years of Assyrian and Babylonian history in a single episode that I really had to pad out. Anyway, thank you for listening.